Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to RL Aftershock episode 22, the quintessential podcast for everything that is European Rocket League eSports. I am Jay. Joining me is Bacon for this final episode as we approach the deadline for the RLRS qualifier as it is today as of me recording this. Probably today as you're listening to this, I'm hoping to get this out ASAP. Uh, no guarantees on that from because, of course, we have also got to uh, do some re-rendering because, as you can tell, there is no video in this week's podcast, uh, no live stream either. It's pure audio uh, with a couple of pictures on your screens for the YouTube version. I'm Jay. Again, Bacon is joining me. It's been a weird, weird week for Rocket League, especially with the RLRS signups closing very, very soon. You're like looking at it like there's a lot of different teams changing up mm. and moving about. And it's like, well, OK, where where do we stand on this one? Where where, where do we stand on a lot of these squads? What's the, what, does the, what does the outcome look like for the grand scale of Rocket League? And of course, we'll be talking about a few of those things today. But first, Bacon, how have you been? Yeah, been good. It's uh, been a pretty chill week. Uh, been enjoying the trials over at Rewind. Then this weekend, having the uh, stuff going on over at Rival, you know, with the Winter Open, that was good fun to cast. Uh, that PSG versus Flipside match, like, just going to cut to it, like, a little bit now as a preview, but that was an absolute nuts series. So it's been a good week. Indeed, it has been a good week, and it's been a very interesting week as well. Obviously, we've had the trials going on for Rewind Gaming. Uh, we've had the Winter Open from Rival Esports, which we will be covering at the very end of the show. Plus, we're talking about some of the rosters as they get ready for the RLRS qualifiers. And we're also talking about Triple Trouble, because they seem to be in a little bit of trouble of their own right, Bacon. Mm -hmm. But first, <laughs> let's talk about Savet Geneva. Now, we don't want to cover all of the squads, because otherwise we would be here for an hour and a half just talking about potential for the RLRS qualifiers. But we did want to talk about this team because it seems like Savets have dropped their main squad. Now, there is only a little bit of information in regards to this. In fact, the main source quoted in, in terms of uh, in, in terms of them losing or, or dropping their entire team is reported by Liquipedia, is this one tweet from Talk, uh, Stocky who says, quote, if someone is still in need of a third looking for people to team up with, I'm LFT. Retweets appreciated. And in double asterisk, no explanation. Now, usually there's like some sort of like thing like, okay, well, you know, we, we've been dropped from whatever squad or, you know, they'll be explaining whatever's going on. So it seems like it wasn't the most smoothest of transitions, Bacon, if it's indeed the case. Yeah, definitely. Like, I'm just looking over this whole sort of debacle because it has been a mess just out of left field. No one expecting that. That's why I bring this one no. up. Stocky has somehow fallen in place because, you know, Pashi has been, you know, out of retirement once again. It didn't last that long. But instantly to that tweet, put in his name there, like, Dude, come play with me and kill number seven. That yeah, is I do, a I do, I do solid love, by the way, how he, dog I, roster. You know? I, I do love how like Pashi's literally just added himself in one of the responses. <laughs> it's fucking fantastic. Um, but yeah, no, obviously, like you know, Stocky has gone on to form up with Pashi. I know that obviously on the uh, on the Liquipedia pages, um, they did say. Where is it? I can't tell where the, where the fuck it is, but like it does it, it does say that they they, they are uh, teaming up with Killer Number Seven as well to be the Buzzer Beaters. That's what the name of the squad, mm -hmm. the Buzzer Beaters. So you know some some very old names in that one. Obviously, we knew that Killer and Patchy were going to team up anyway, but to have Stocky on that board as the third man, like that seems like a pretty legit, um, uh, you know, a, a, a pretty. Roster. Yeah, a pretty legit roster, all things considered. But the main thing I want to focus on for this story is, in particular, the remaining players from Savet mm. Geneva. Obviously, Rizex, Coca, and Kiva reportedly are also out, according to Liquipedia. Again, the main source that they quoted was this tweet, because there's been no information from those guys as of, as of right now, at least uh, as, far, as far as my research has gone. So, like, w w what's the situation with those guys? You know, w w what's going on with Savet Geneva? Because they've only had this team for a month, you know, before mm. they only... They, they literally like they picked them up on January 25th. We're recording this on February 25th, and this tweet came out yesterday. So it's been literally less than a full month before Savet Geneva have called it a day. So for me, looking at this, because remember, this has been a team outside of Savet picking them up, to be honest, that have been around for, I'm going to say, about four months or so, which in bubble team sort of like length is actually quite a while. You know, bubble teams only last for about a month themselves. To me, this looks like Rizex and Coca don't want to play with stock anymore. They think there's going to be greener pastures elsewhere picking up a new third. Hence why the whole no explanation. Stocky don't want to talk about it. He's probably been burned on this one. Um, again, that's a probably. We have no actual evidence, whatever. This then leaves Vet Geneva in a bit of a sticky situation. They've got Kiva there. We're talking... 
before this whole pickup of to be honest about skyline maybe returning he's gone very quiet recently so for me looks like this could be a good pickup like skyline just steps in fills out the requirements he'll play alongside kiva and they'll probably just get skyline to pick up a third man whatever he says sort of goes because he's got that level about him you know he's got that prestige he's been in the rlcs and all of that multiple times now and so Savet Geneva will probably, in the future, be a bit careful about picking up, you know, these largely foreign teams. Because, remember, when they picked up, to be honest, uh, Stocky Swiss, Rizex and Coca are both German. So that's why Kiva got picked up, was purely to fill out the requirements. Because in TCS and the Swiss Esports League, uh, they require two out of the three players to be Swiss. And so Savet Geneva here... I mean, when they've just got Rizex and Coca being left over, they probably just went, no, sodgy lads, we only care about the Swiss players, which is fair enough because of the whole rules of the leagues and their regions, you know? So where does this leave Savet Geneva in the grand scale as an organization of, 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 of you know, Rocket League, essentially? Because it, it was looking like, okay, they're going to be signed up for the next season of the TCS Esports mm. League and SCSL, as you were mentioning just a moment ago. Uh, I think they have to keep most of their roster. And, of course, their main team that was in the TCS Esports League is now going uh, away, essentially. So there, there was some chatter. There was a lot of chatter, actually, about the idea that mm. Skyline might be coming back. And I'd, I'd say this because, obviously, we were at the TCS Esports land. We casted it. And that is exactly what all the rumors, all, all, all the little like you know echoes throughout the halls were saying. Well, like, yeah, that's why this... we were surprised when Kiva got picked up because it's like, oh, we thought Skyline was going to be taking that spot, and it'd be sort of like this is his break season, if you want to put it that way, because he hasn't been like I said seen around the scene in a while. It's been a bit quiet. Um, looking at this now, like I said, I reckon this will definitely be Skyline coming back because sort of paid spot doing it whatever it's quite easy for him to uh just step into the scene because like you said a little bit earlier tcs is an rlrs standard you know it's more lower end bubble teams that's absolutely fine because it's a national league uh expect that from any old national league to be honest um kiva and skyline together are two fantastic players skyline being just given free will to bring in whoever he wants because remember they've already met the prerequisite of two swiss players so I know Skyline could bring in a French teammate or whatever and be very happy about that. And that then is Savet done. The only problem is we were looking at Savet going, oh, they're making another run for an RLRS spot, you know, which would have been fantastic. But near enough, that is shut down with flames now. Well, actually, I wanted to sort of like talk about the idea that Safair might come back because obviously he was part of the Savet Geneva side um, alongside alongside Sack and Flav that on, and ended up winning the TCS Esports LAN. And I was just mm. going through some of the results from the DreamHack Pro Circuit and especially the Decamp Gaming Greenfield Winter Cup. I was just taking a look at the team that he competed in, Flav, uh, 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 called Full Yolo and Prey, mm -hmm. uh, which actually ended up coming up coming in third place where they won 150 euros. And the team he, and the players he played with was, incidentally enough, Casio. And Skyline. So, what what what's, what's the notion that maybe those two might be teaming up to to re to sort of like re up the uh, Savet Geneva brand and potentially mm. adding in uh, the likes of uh, Flav, for example, who who also of course won the TCS Esports land. Like that I mean, would obviously fill Flav out two would or three be players the from the sub, last... if anything, because he's gone onto a management role. We talked to him; and he doesn't particularly uh, want to play anymore. He's uh, busy with like real life. Did stuff, I say did I say Flav? Seven. Sorry, I meant to say Sack. My bad. Sack, I don't know uh, what he's up to at the moment because, again, he's sort of, like, gone on to this sort of, like, back into finding new teammates across the whole region. So we haven't seen much of him um, over the last months. Uh, but I would pretty much pull it down. Yeah, Safair coming back, Skyline coming in alongside Kiva would be the best shot. Maybe Sack comes back if... Uh, you know, Safair and Skyline there, like, we don't want to play with Kiva. But Savet are, like, I would say safe, you know? Like, they can pull some players in, and they'll pull in good players. So I'm not too worried. It's just that difference of we were hoping they were going to be back into RLRS because it had been cool. But looking at it now, they probably won't make the run for it. 
Yeah, possibly, well, probably not now that we've seen, obviously, the whole fallout with this roster. I mean, it, it, again, I'm not sure how true this is that, you know, Coco and Rizek are going, because, again, the only real source that has been quoted on Liquipedia and quoted by everybody else and everything else that I've seen, it seems that it's only that one tweet from Stocky that's given them the fucking, um, you know, that's given them the idea. So, um, again, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it would be the case, because it's Liquipedia, and I know that the guys there generally tend to, like, be able to, uh, uh, you know, generally those guys try their best to, like, Mm. you know get all the facts straight and put it out as a speculation even if it's speculation that they've got decent reputable and confirmed sources so yeah i'm gonna assume for now that Savet geneva have dropped their roster which is a bit of a shame again it's only been a month and of course these guys didn't really have their chance to do anything massive on the international stage but hey ho that's the nature of esports that's the nature of rocket league but moving on to one team that's officially gone and one that is certainly on shaky ground right now bacon i i, I... Do you know what? It feels like this this team is cursed right now, okay? Because mm -hmm. ever since Speed left Triple Trouble, of, and ever since they also left the Red Reserve organization, it feels like Triple Trouble have just been in a very, very fucking awkward time. It's just not been looking good for them. And case in point has been this last little bit of drama that happened uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, in regards to Rams, obviously Rams was brought in as the coach uh, mm -hmm. a, a few uh, about a few days ago, and we were all saying, "Yes, that's great." Obviously, he's a great he's a great coach. He's done really good stuff with MV during the Elite Series. So having him triple trouble to have those assets available to him, like shit, he could be able to do some really good work with a team that's already what you would say top six in Europe in, in the European region. But as was posted two days ago on a big twit longer from Rams, he said he's leaving triple trouble. He's LFT, um, and the interesting part about this is that he, he kind of does go into Triple Trouble by quite the amount. Um, I will I'll, I'll read off a little bit of an expert. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find it. Uh, let me see if I can... Uh, 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 sorry, because it's like a really big fucking thing. I didn't actually highlight where I mm. wanted to um, uh, uh, go on. Um, so... He was talking about speaking to players, and she said, you know, I spoke to players, including Speed individually, and gave them some things to work on to try and limit errors coming in from the team. Some of these players took this advice, and others, with a bracket of S, didn't. Uh, once I checked up on players who didn't take my advice and saw how they got uh, how they were getting on, they became extremely defensive and began... Uh, ironic, actually, because apparently the issues were that he was trying to work on defense, <laughs> which is like, oh, yeah, that's great, um, and began to complain and question why I was offering these improvements. This left a sour taste in my mouth, and it was essentially my job. I explained this to them, and they assured me that they would work to improve. Fast forward to now, to this day, the players have not followed my suggestions, and it has been evident in the recent string of poor performances. I am not one to single out players, uh, but when part of the roster is um, uh, what well, part of the roster is constantly looking to improve and the other is staying stubborn and sulking, it's not hard to point fingers and see the same recurring mistakes being made. This frustrated me, and considering how players have acted towards me in this time, I've chosen to part ways with Triple Trouble. The last straw came from players spreading misinformation about me on a public stream and portraying me in a light that I am not, when I've done nothing but tried to help improve this roster, dedicating my unpaid time and effort to, into it, for it to be thrown back in my face. Now, that would be already a pretty juicy story that we could start to speculate on, but there's more to it than that. In a now-deleted tweet, mm. and one that we actually was able to uh, recover, uh, I'll put on Imja, uh, Ronicky tweeted out about this, saying, quote, imagine making a twit long of a sympathy when the only thing I denied was playing six-man for a personal reason, constantly attacking me in our team chat and talking straight and, and talking straight down to me. God damn, people do anything for attention. Now time for, for people to tell me I am wrong, smiley face. Okay, um, so... <laughs> <sighs> fucking hell. So, unfortunately, like, like, at the very least, the story does have a little ending because Ram did tweet, mm. okay, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, you know, the sport's been amazing. Me and Ronicky have talked things through and we're at peace. I still remain LFT, etc. Um, and obviously, Triple Trouble went on to announce their final roster for RLCS being, obviously, Ronicky, Tadpole, Cassio, substitute of Sieb, and, of course, uh, Bass is their main manager. But even then, there's still some background sort of bits and pieces where it seems like the team is kind of falling apart. Because as well as not only that story on Reddit, I've included some comments in our show document. You probably may or may not have been able mm -hmm. to see here, Bacon. No, but you can see that Tadpole is essentially backing Rams in regards to some of these uh, uh, in, in regards to some of these comments. Like there's one uh, one comment from a guy saying, "So Ronicky or Tadpole or both, place your bets." And Tadpole comes, "Hi, it's not me, Ty." Uh, and also, he's also said something uh, on another thread saying Rams is saying the truth. Uh, as well as that, obviously, Rams has come out and supported uh, Casio in the time uh, in the time when these tweets are sorted out. So it kind of does point to the idea that Ronicky is 
it, it, it was essentially like being a, a bit of a problem within the context of what Rounds was trying to do with the team. So mm. let's 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 approach this with a certain level of care, Bacon, because while there's a part of me that says absolutely Rams is in the right. There's another part of me that's, you know, a little bit sympathetic to Ronicky's current situation, you know? Well, I'm just going to say I find it quite hard because we know that the lad does have some outbursts uh, from what we've seen in the past, you know, within personal uh, sort of circumstances. Not for me, of course, but for others. And so this sort of behavior isn't, I would say... A surprise the problem is when it's the captain of the team you know near enough the captain needs to be a bit more mature uh try and look out for the wellness of the team and so a loss like this you know a coach to them i wouldn't say so much a coach but more of an analyst trying to help them improve could especially when they're bringing in casio as a newbie to the well not a newbie to the roster but you know just for the new season coming on it seems very uh, bullish, you know, where they're quite panicked. They're frustrated, the Triple Trouble roster at the moment, naturally, because... Absolutely, yeah. It's more because they weren't expecting Speed to go, and you can't blame Speed. I mean, looking at their recent performances, you definitely can't blame Speed. Like, they've been on form. Like, Flipside have somehow come out on top after using, losing UK. And we thought like this was going to be the period where UK would finally come through for them, you know? And so Speed seems to have fitted in perfectly. And even when they're playing this weird style where they do still double commit in that because they're still learning each other's rotations, they're fast enough, they're capable enough to be able to cover for those mistakes. Whereas looking at Triple Trouble... Coming in Casio, I thought was decent in their first show, and, you know, for the um, DreamHack qualifiers. But then when it came around to DreamHack, they, when they played, they didn't do as expected. You know, going out on the first day, they're a little bit harsh on themselves, yes. But I think the frustration got the better of them. And this is something they will have to work on because when we look up... Uh, the RLCS coming in the next few months. We've been talking about it, and we're looking at seven teams here that are all capable of making it to land. Triple trouble with little errors like this are going to be the ones where you're going to look at and going, okay, they'll probably come out at the bottom of the seven. Of course, I don't hope so. I don't hope that upon any of the teams. You know, it just comes down to the day when they're playing each other because they're all great teams. Love the lads, but... Triple Trouble, little errors like this is what is going to break you when it comes to RLCS, isn't it? Yeah, and again, I, I'm 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 very I'm treading with careful ground on this one because mm. for me, in my mind, and the way that I sort of approach my known knowledge of the game, obviously I'm not a very good um, player myself. But you know, uh, if if I ever was trying to play seriously, I would take advice from someone who, you know, is is relatively experienced and has sort of the mindset for the game. Someone like Rams, for example, who you know is there to help improve. He gives advice. He gives some sort of solid so, solid sort of improvement points. And obviously, the point is that you're supposed to listen to him because he'll take a look at the the vods he'll take a look at the demos he'll tell you you know what where where we're going wrong where you need to improve at the end of the day that's that is essentially what the what the, what the role of a coach is supposed to be within that context but for Ronicky, at the same time, like it's it's been a rough, rough year mm. so far. It's only two months in for him, and already, you know, there was tweets earlier about the idea that he might have cancer, which is extremely stressful. Or mm. he lost his dad a few weeks ago, and it's just like you know, I I, I I can sympathize with the frustration on his part, and I can sympathize with obviously the personal reasons of him not wanting to play six mans because grief is a funny thing, man. Like it's such a yep. it, it's such a big sort of like mental weight down, and it's in a game like. Rocket League, where you have to be, you have to have some mental fortitude. You know, you have to be ready to you know, to, to take those big losses down. You have to be able to be ready to turn your whole mentality around in, in the drop of a single game and reverse sweep your way to victory. And for some, some, t for some, you know, and it's extra uh, extenuating circumstances like that, you know, uh, plus all the speed drama that's been going, and not the speed drama, but obviously the, the speed situation with him leaving Red Reserve when Red Reserve mm. were like white hot, you know, and obviously just for, for him, for the captain. Like as a captain himself, you know, you got to imagine that Ronicky is, is not in a fantastic place at the moment. Yeah. So I, I'm, I, I do want to, I, I do want to say, yeah, okay, 
absolutely Rams has a right to be able to come out and say this sort of stuff and, and, and have like a bit of a say on it. But at the same time, I, I am semi-sympathetic to Ronicky's sort of uh, current mental me mental state, you know? Hmm. Well, falling out with coaches, falling out with teammates happens naturally. And so it's there like no one here I would necessarily say is in the wrong. It's just a natural proceedings of things and it's all understandable. So no sort of like bad blood from anyone in the community towards Ronarchy. And Absolutely of course, not, definitely no. not to Rams. Like the big support was there to Rams. It's just there like it's understandable. He's in a shitty place. It happens. Just Triple trouble, try and keep cracking on because, like I said, this is a team that could make land, could make the RCS land, and they've just got to get themselves into the right mindset. At the end of the day, this will probably mature them more than anything, and so they, if they can, you know, work through it, they'll come out better for it. And definitely the mental aspect, like you said, within Rock League, where every single game matters so much more than most other esports because there's less competitions you've got to have that mental aspect in the game. Absolutely. And, and you know, there's, there's no team that I want to see succeed more than Triple Trouble. You know, mm. those guys have had bad hand after bad hand dealt to them and constantly they've been able to come through. So I'm, I'm really, really hoping that, that, that Ronicky can push forward through this one and, and somehow come out with like a really, really good result to his name. Um, just, just because, you know, I, 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 want, I still want to see them succeed, you know. I still think that they could succeed with Casio in, in, in place of speed. I think that they could go for a good run. I don't, I don't know if they'll be able to make it into the, into the land this season, but I certainly would hope that they stay in RLCS this season. I think it's a possibility. I think it's a plausibility right now for Triple Trouble, um, even though, you know, they have lost a lot of backing. And again, you know, I, I, I only wish nothing but the best for Ronicky. I think that's, if, if you don't say that, you're a bit of an arsehole at this yeah. stage. So, you know. I, I mean, you know, if, if there's any advice I could give to Ronicky, you know, I mean, I've, I've had my own life experiences. I can tell you right now that losing a family member really fucking sucks. And, you know, I understand where you're where, where you're coming from. But, you you know, try and see if you can see it from the other person's perspective. At the end of the day, your teammates, your coaches, everyone here wants to see you succeed. I want to fucking see you succeed. Mm. I really want to see you go and absolutely smash everybody in the RLCS. So, you know... Make that your focus and make sure that everybody knows it and, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll have a good time, you know? That's it. A little bit of a, uh, yeah, a touchy story at the end. So you can't say much more. Like, the possibilities are all there. But, again, just work for it. Therapy, something like that. Maybe trying to separate your work life, essentially the Rock League life, to personal and that background sort of and hopefully try and improve it there because if you just blow up every single time, it's not going to help. You're not going to progress from it, are you? Absolutely. Well, again, nothing but the best for Triple Trouble. Nothing but the best for Monarchy. That is the story of Triple Trouble currently seeming on shaky ground. But of course, of course, the big news, obviously, the good news is that obviously Rams and Monarchy talked it through. They came out. Uh, they came out obviously with good respect and putting put essentially burying the hatchet behind them. And they will con uh, continue forward on the Triple Trouble part to try and make it into the RLCS finals next season. So. That's the news over and done with for the week. Again, I know we're missing a lot of different rosters and a lot of different moves that are just, there's just too many to, to go through, guys. There's so mm. many. Again, we're probably going to do a big sort of roundup feature when we come to the 128 team playing for the RLRS. So we'll come to that as we come to it. We'll, we'll, we'll burn that bridge as we come to it, essentially, yeah, as, as one of our good friends in, uh, in, in RAF <laughs> would say, in the middle of a bar after the DCS lab finals. Right. But Such enough about quote. that. It's such a good fucking quote. Oh my God, I want that on a t-shirt. I want that shit on a t-shirt. Literally, no. You're going to hate it when it happens and just deal with that <laughs> shit when the shit comes. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Right, but let's go on to our mailbag because we had a ton of questions come in after the DreamHack Leipzig tournament and obviously we can't answer them all because there's this, there was so much to do last week with the with the DreamHack results and there are a few. We've got a bit of a backlog going back to the beginning of the month. A couple from Frostbite. One asked from Trox as well. We've got three questions to go through so let's break it down one by one. Question Question one comes in from our good friend Frostbite. I love him, but can people please stop having him pop up in our feeds? Exponate, oh, sorry, it's not explanation from our Discord. We're not live at the moment. But <laughs> if you want, you can go to the description and show notes of the audio and video versions of this podcast. And you can go to the Discord link where you can join up with our little community. And you can ask us a mailbag question. And chances are we will answer it on the podcast recording. So 
I'm thinking Frostbite. of like the Lord of the Rings meme there from Sam. Just share the load. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that in the way that you played it. Oh, Jesus, Jay. Come on. <laughs> what can I say, man? I've been on Tinder too much. Right. Frostbite <laughs> asks, do you think collaborating with more third parties for some of the esports stuff, Psyonix, uh, will have an easier time uh, uh, Time of it as a company? Duh. Essentially, you know, I think that's pretty obvious. But the particular example he quotes is ESIC, the Esports Integrity Commission. And I mean, obviously, like we we've always said, fucking let, 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 let's 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 let like, hey, right? Come on, guys, let, let's let's give some work to the rewinds and the rivals and the, the you know, uh, you know, the the my insanities and the ESLs and the uh, dream hacks. Well, when NLGs. you look at it, just go ahead and say it's Rocket Street that have the Grand Series, you know, the South American uh, stuff, the route to there. So they are doing it. It's just Sonics are very slow to allow third parties to come on in. This year, that will change and it'll keep on changing where they'll allow one or two companies, one or two organizations to come in and take a large load. And it's near enough not going to be taking the load away, sorry, but in addition. So, like we said, it's it's a no-brainer for third parties coming in to take some of the esports aspects, but it's near enough going to be Sionix will oversee a lot because that's what they want to do because Rocket League is their baby. you got to think, this is Rocket League is actually the fourth game that Sionix made from scratch. Um, really? Yep. SOP was the first one. Then it was... Um, Oh, these two little like mobile games and then Rocket League. Their other stuff had been contractual work for stuff like um, Unreal Tournament and that sort of jazz. But actual fully themselves games rock league is only the fourth one there they were very small he's like a very small game org that did a lot of contractual work because that's how you can be profitable within Holy the gaming shit. industry they worked on x common mass effect and home yep. front and gears of what the shit i Bullet had no Storm. idea about this what they did a lot of small because you know when a game company you know makes a game they, did they hire in. tournament three are you kidding yep. me I, I had apps. I did Sonics not know about worked on any so of this. much shit. That's how they can I've... come out with a game. Like, because you know, you think of it like Rocket League came out such a well polished game, really, in the grand scheme of things, from an indie dev, but they have so much pedigree in their contractual work behind them that it's actually not surprising, you know? I was I, I did not expect to see that when I went to research this a bit more. My <laughs> word. All right, fair enough. Then. Remember, I've um, known Sonics for like over ten years since SARP. So, ah, fair yeah. enough. You're, you're a sub BC <laughs> there. I'm a bit of a new newbie scrub, but you know, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. The, 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 I, I, I was surprised to see that. Honestly, like I, I did not expect to hear that. I mean, yeah, I do understand that. Again, I feel like there's a bit more delegation that could go around. I mean, like there is one thing that Frostbite actually brings up an example. He talks about the e ESIC, which is the Esports mm. Integrity Commission. For those of you who don't know what that is, is a funding of a lot of different um, esports organizations and tournament organizers to essentially help protect the integrity of esports, you know, to stop things like cheating going on and match fixing going on. They fight for player rights, but they also fight for tournament rights and they fight for developer rights. They try and make sure that everything is on an even playing field. They make sure that shit like match fixing does not become rife within at least the Western world, uh, because I know in Asia there are some issues in match fixing, which ESIC hasn't quite expanded no to. Help because in that. <laughs> Just, they're yeah. gone. They're done. Just yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, I, I, hope, I, I hope. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's going to take a lot more than just ESIC to help fix match, mm -hmm. uh, not 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 fix matches, but you know, to uh, to help solve <laughs> the match fixing problem in Asia at the moment. Um, you know, uh, I. But, you know, getting ESIC in, for ex for example, for Rocket League and help and getting them to, you know, sort of like help manage things from a, from a, from a, from an integrity perspective, I think that would help a lot without a lot of the, with, with a lot of, with a few problems that Rocket League has, you know, there have been some various different problems that we've had with tournament organizers in, in the adminning side of things. Obviously, I'll go back to the Renegade Cup because it's the most recent example for it, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. You talk about, you know, some, you talk about some issues that Sonics have with gambling, for example, like I was recently consulting another tournament organizer who wanted to do a, a, a tournament and I was looking through the community guidelines to make sure we could see whatever we want. And they have like a hard lock, essentially, like no exceptions on the gambling rule, essentially. And obviously, mm. we've been big sort of supporters about the idea of getting gambling in. One of the main sort of like arguments against gambling is obviously that, that pros can match fix. Uh, you know, they can place bets on the other team and then just throw the match, essentially, so that way they can influence the outcome. That way they can get a, a much better payout, uh, especially at a lower level of, of, of Rocket League. But 
for a um uh, you know for for an organization like ESIC to come in that would help like sort of prevent that and stop that from happening and obviously mm -hmm. impose really harsh punishments like for a match fixing punishment if you're a member of ESIC it's like two years or so of just non-competitive play like you you can't fucking touch the esports landscape if you if you match fix for like an extended period mm -hmm. of time and again I, I feel like with that with that being the primary issue when it comes to or the primary argument against gambling uh within the rocket league context uh you know i, I feel like that that would also help that sort of like side of things and uh, you know help out with issues in the past that we've had like you know account sharing going on in rocket league that would help out with punishing those guys as appropriate you know and at esic they've got a lot of pedigree they know what they're doing in esports you know Oh yeah, definitely agreed. Like that sort of like group ethic really does work within esports because, like you said, the whole banning not only applies to players but sometimes can apply to whole teams. Which then, you know, the orgs themselves will be completely trying to watch over their players and make sure that doesn't happen. So it's just simple things like there is more that Psionics can do by using outside sources of help, such as ESIC, for the example. Yeah, and uh, yeah, essentially, and, and you know, it, it also extends to other organizations as well. You know, like I would love to see an EU studio, for example. You know, like it, it would be nice if Psionics delegated something. I'm going to bang on about it for ages because obviously, you know, it, 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 it's, it's something that, you know, I have personal stake in because obviously it affects us EU casters if we got an EU studio and suddenly we're the front runners for, you know, the, the RLRS, for example, the EU RLRS or. Mm any other sort of like a uh, rocket league uh, related project that could be done from an eu studio like that you know it it, it, it it would be something like for us to do but you know there are some really big organizations that uh, that operate in the european region you know dreamhack is obviously one of those that we talked about in the past esl uk would love to do one star ladder also recently uh, they got the uh, what was it the, the the pubg european league uh, contract from from uh, from from PUBG Corp, so you know the, the, mm. the, these guys are open to doing contractual work for doing you know for developers. You know I know ESL run the Rainbow Six stuff. You know the Six Invitation was recently a really good project from them. So you know it would be nice if Psionics delegated a little bit more towards you know some of the other organisations that could help. You know not only you know push the esport forward but also fund the esport. You know I'd like to see more tournaments from third parties. I'd love to see different things. You know that that Psionics can't necessarily do within their own individual remit. You know. Yeah, and when you look at it, it can also like help with the funding of that because, say, going for using European RLRS as the example, then you've if you went out and contracted it to ESL, you're not paying the whole sort of front of running that tournament. Instead, ESL will pay for a lot of it, but they'll be allowed to get in their own sponsorship for it and such. That's how it generally works. The only difference is, and looking from it, definitely the uh, partnership with uh, Turner and that, it's not going to happen because Sionix definitely wants to keep it to himself or keep within close proximity working with one exclusive partner for everything. They don't want to split up teams over a single franchise. Yeah, and I, I and I, I feel like that's probably a bit of a you know it, it would be a regressive sort of move I think for Sionix to be able to do that again. I want mm. to see more. I want to see more from other organisations. Whether it will happen is another thing, but I also think that collaborating with third parties, as Sionic, as Frostbite asks will help things in the esports perspective so thank you for your question on to your second question though because you're not done um obviously <laughs> frostbite just asks so many fucking questions i love the guy again please someone else out there ask some other help questions him. <laughs> help him help him uh, contribute to the podcast to a certain extent um but frostbite also asked the second question a few weeks later again this is a bit of a backlog going back to the beginning of the month but he talks about casting and i really wanted to put this one in because it is a subject so close to my heart bacon you know it is uh, and he asks often the casters in csgo are praised for being the best in all of esports do you see the talent of rl ever get to that level I'm going to pose to you first, because I've got a lot to say on this past topic. So what do you think about the idea that Rocket League talent will never be praised as the best well, in all of esports? To straight up compare different esports and definitely their casters to each other, because the styles are so completely different between them. You know, taking CS to Rocket League to League of Legends, all of that. FIFA, Rainbow Six, the casting styles are completely different, so it's quite hard to compare them. Generally, the reason why cs is praised so much is because they've got a larger audience which is very much outspoken to see that we've got talent of rock league ever get to that level i mean when you look at let's take uh shogun and fundable carpet for that this is rock league moment that is sort of like the sort of pinnacle excitement uh i would definitely say 
Shogun is up there as one of the sort of like definitely the in my opinion the best caster in Rocket League. Oh yeah. Um, and probably very close into like you know the high numbers of best casters in all of esports. But it's that problem of comparing different games to each other. It it's not on. It's like trying to compare a football commentator to a rugby one. It's very very different in the landscape of things. You know. I can sort of see that to a certain extent, you know, again, it's only a halfway comparison when you're talking about, you know, different esports mm. and, 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 and how sort of casting is approached. Because obviously one of the key things about doing different esports, from my own personal experience, you know, I've done, I've done three games in the past, you know, I was sorry, actually scratched out four games in the past. And I can tell you from that each different one is very, very different in the way you pace yourself and the way that you approach sort mm -hmm. of a play, especially in the play by play aspect that I do, you know, like you have to, you have to approach it in a very different style and a different manner of form. You know, you've got to find out the right, right times to throw right pacing in terms of the matchup how are you gonna when are you gonna pick up the pace when are you gonna get really excited how do you know when to get really excited about certain situations and for an analyst obviously it's even harder because obviously you've got to learn so many different aspects about the games and it's very difficult to keep track of every little thing that's going on on screen at one time so it is a bit of an unfair comparison but i do think that in terms of just general skills there are some that overlap and, you know, especially with Counter-Strike and Rocket League, I think that there are some things that Rocket League casters can learn from CSGO. So I think that there is potential for RL talent to get to that level. But I think a few things need to change. Number one... I mean, you can take inspiration from each other. Because I was going to say, definitely, you know, how when me and you cast together, we do sort of like a very podcasty laid back. And then you jump into the action when that happens. And that is definitely something which we sort of stole from what CS casting is, you know, because no one else in Rocket League sort of really did that. It was always very much sections. You do your play by play and then I'll do my color. But you know, definitely me, Jay, I don't like that sort of style. And it's well, all about their advancement, but you'll see this from a lot of different esports. where they'll take from others because that's already got a set sort of um, example there for you to be able to copy and then expand upon. Well, that's one of the things I was going to say. It's something I think that needs to change, to be honest. I think we need to let loose a little bit. You need to just, like, chill out. And the play-by-play -play doesn't always have to do all the play-by-play, -play, and the color doesn't mm -hmm. always have to do the color. And the main reason why I say something like that is because in Counter-Strike, we don't... or what, we, When we do fit those sort of, like, conventions, like, right now, the best two uh, the best two sort of, like, casters in the scene right now, they are certainly, like, one's a very clearly defined play-by-play, -play, the other's a very clearly defined color caster. Right, say the Kist and Henry G are the guys I'm talking about. But those I actually guys, don't like Henry G. You don't like Henry G, really? No. Wow. He annoys me. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but again, that's opinions, you know? That's the point. So this is another point in my thing of, like, saying the best uh, talent in that. And you look at it and go, oh, yeah, it could be the best talent for this person, but someone else might not like him. It's a lot of, um, well, entertainment is based upon opinions in that regard. True, true. But like the reason why those two are referred to is like what two of the best casters in the scene right now is because they are defined as a play by play and say the kiss part mm. and Henry G being a, a defined color caster. But the thing about it is that one of the and one of the things that we've tried to do in our own little like bubble scene style, us lot, you know, me and you and crafters and jam and, and I really, you mm -hmm. know, one thing that we've always tried to do is we've tried to sort of like, you know, blend the roles a little bit, which is some sort of inspiration that I took from 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 uh, from, uh, from 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 those guys, you know, uh, mm. you know, Matt is always one to sort of like jump in do some really like really really big uh, play by play and like get really hyped up and and, and sort of like uh, um and you know like and, and do some really really fast talking and and and, and deliver some like really really weird but also really cool lines you know like he'll, he'll make a metaphor that's fucking so sick for the for the manner for the for the way that it works or he'll start rhyming his words together like honestly if you compare play by play aspects i take a lot of inspiration from say kiss like it's, mm. it's very heavy but one of the things he'll also do is that when the match isn't quite as hype and massive as anything he'll pick something out and he'll do something and, and do a little bit of color casting just to sort of like help contribute to, to henry's sort of like more in-depth analysis and then when henry is in the middle of color casting and he sees a massive execution coming in on this bomb site, he will like take over a little bit of the play-by-play, -play, start things off with the opening frags, then pass back off to say the kiss who picks up with his own specialism of what play-by-play -play is, and that I think mm. is peak commentary. I think you can fit that into any style of 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 casting, including Rocket League. And I can tell you for Rocket League because we've done it, right? And I don't know if you've been watching Reddit lately, but I've had a lot of praise for that shit. So. 
You know, that's one thing I think needs to change, you know, and, 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 and the cool thing about that as well is that it also solves a little bit of a problem that I have with the way of, of, of the way, the way that flow goes in Rocket League, because with the whole static play by play color, none of them ever mix sort of style mm. that we have in North America, especially we have situations where the color caster will be in the middle of a point, then a goal will start to come through and it'll awkwardly hand back off to the play by play. And let me tell you, it was one of the most awkward things I've ever heard in, 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 in my time doing mm -hmm. casting. Like, I think that that's sort of, that, I think that that, that shit needs to change um you know i think it's one of the most annoying aspects i find it in, in rocket league casting as a whole when i came in i was like i don't ever want to do that so from day one i was always like look if you want to take over a bit of play by play because you think the cast benefits from it go right ahead you know I, I said that from my first day in rival i said that for my first day in leaf league you know because it was one of the aspects that always hurt me the one, one of the aspect not hurt me but you know it was one of, always one of the always the aspects of casting in rocket league at the time that triggered me the most so i always said if a goal's coming in just play by play for it a little bit and then hand back off to me when you know the time is right essentially and, and again we've sort of like you know brought that back up in our own style we've developed it somewhat we've come a long way with uh, the way that we do things in the bubble scene Another thing that I also think that needs to change as well with the way that casting works in terms of a structure level, the reason why CSGO casters are praised for being the best is because also there is such an abundance of fucking really good ones right now. You know me, right? The reason why I hold casting to a high standard in Rocket League is because I'm held to such a ridiculous standard in Counter-Strike and everybody is, right? Richard Lewis said it best when he said you could put all the best casters in Counter-Strike in a bus and then drive that bus off the bridge and nothing would change in broadcasting because we have so many good casters at a tier two level that could come up to tier one and a tier three guys could come up to tier two and it would all just be just as good. You know, it, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, you know, you, you Content you would go on. That's yeah, the, the show would go on pretty much unaffected. And I don't think you can say the same thing for Rocket League because, you know, there are so few opportunities for anyone who's below the RLRS level, you know? Mm. And, well, that is one good thing with the Renegade Cup that we saw from not only this weekend but before is that the sort of outside region, they are starting to get the chances to be able to progress because the problem with Rocket League at the moment is that those below are struggling to advance themselves because there is no progression to go into. But stuff like Renegade Cup will help that and whatever plans Sionix have down the line will hopefully be able to progress the castles that are just below what I... You know, tier one is your RLCS, tier two, RLRS, tier three is the bottom, and that's the um, guys that are doing the Renegade Cup stuff, you know, like within the community. And so for them to be able to go up and then get some studio work or that sort of lovely, jubbly stuff is good to see. One thing I also want to see, one last little point, obviously, is variety. Of course, I'm going to say this <laughs> because, like, fucking, you know, I, I, I understand the NA bias uh, in terms of working with North American casters, but, like, EU has such a massive pool of talent. I really would like to see a lot of those guys get developed, uh, you know, e even below us. You know, like, there there are some guys out there that do some really good work, and I want to see them get some chances. So, you know, mm. and, and, and the cool thing about Counter-Strike as well is the fact that there is something for everybody. There is the really emotional caster that gets behind the matches and sort of, like, conveys audio in some ocean in the in his voice there is the one who uses wordplay for example and the one that you know like that can can, can you know come up with a ridiculous phrase that somehow manages to satisfy the uh, the cast in such a really cool sort of um in such a really cool sort of manner, even though you wouldn't expect it. And obviously you've got the color casters who come in, they can articulate their points really, really well. You've got the pessimist color casters, you've got the optimist color casters, you've got the analysts who are really edgy. You know, you can you can pick out any one of the top tier talent and you can see how unique they are to everybody else. I don't think we have that in Rocket League though. That's the one thing, again, those are the three things I think need to change more than anything else. Style, flow, and variety. And when we get there, I do believe that maybe Rocket League talent can get to that level. Mm. And I'm just going to take a personal example, actually, just from doing the uh, rival stuff yesterday. And it was like, we'll get onto it a bit later, but flip side sort of, we're playing very, um, I, I use the example of board very uh, complacent into in the first five games of the series. And the community, sort of like spectators and that, were bagging on to me. And it's because we know from Rocket League, a lot of commentary has to be positive because the response for negativity isn't so good, which I find very weird because when you're uh, naturally, if 
a team's not playing up to level, you should call them out for it. You know, that is naturally, they've been playing so well, you know, you wouldn't expect them to be playing like that if it's DreamHack. And if you're a good team, you take every single game and play to your best, you know? So it's that weird sort of level within, once you start getting new talent come through and more of the talent being able to diversify the scene, then public opinion will be able to change. Then other talent will be able to you know, expand upon each other. And that is the problem with Rock League at the moment is everyone's used the sort of cookie cutter, uh, cookie cutter, cookie, uh, cookie <laughs> cutter sort of template style where everyone's just done the same thing going on. Yeah, and you know, I, I think the whole thing with criticism, it, that's something else that I also think, maybe have a lesser point that needs to change in, in Rocket League casting, but I, I, I don't understand why people don't like the negativity of certain castles. Like, I remember Danny got fucking railed during the Coliseum, for instance. Oh, yeah. And it's like, why? You know, like he, he, he's bringing up a criticism point. You know, the reason why we do this podcast is because we do bring out the flaws in squads and we say them because we think they need to be addressed. And when they get addressed, you get better. That's what criticism mm. is for. They're there to make you better. You say, yeah, sure. A part of it is saying yeah, you're doing this really, really, really well. But another part is saying this is something you're not doing that well. And yes, in some cases, you are doing this part really, really shittily. So... Mm. You know, you, you say that, and then people, they usually get one or two responses. Number one, the really dedicated players will come up and they'll be like, right, well, I'd better improve this. And then the other players or the other you know, fans, especially fans, for example, will say, oh, you're the worst analyst and caster in the world because you're so negative. And it's like, no, that's not that's not the point, right? We, well, no, one, on that example using Danny, he was playing the bad cop. That's how we did it. We had yeah, a little exactly. piece. We were doing good cop, bad cop, because we had so much bloody fun doing it that way. And a lot of the audience, a lot of, you know, bubble scene players absolutely loved it. The ones that didn't like it were generally players that you were commentating over because in that moment they got frustrated to which, you know, we're not commentating for you, the guys playing. We're commentating for those watching at home. And the ones at home, again, because of the whole dynamic, what you're used to, negativity is sort of like frowned upon, even though it shouldn't be. It should be embraced because you're doing a bit. You're doing a piece for that. Completely out of it. You know, Danny, he, wouldn't, he couldn't hurt a fly. He's the nicest or most polite person ever. Get him on the cast back then. He did the negative role because he was doing a Simon Cow sort of piece, <laughs> you know, the Gordon Ramsay, because that's what everyone sort of agreed upon was again this diversity in talent would propel the scene to get even better and he unfortunately got you know beaten down for it yeah and it, it, it sucks big time because like you, you'll find there are people out there that will say much more unreasonable things like you don't want to see my dms you don't want to fucking see my dms from 2016 and 2017 and that's like... just for all the uh dick pics really oh god <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but seriously, when I did my first ever on-camera appearance, like I had, I had some serious shit flown my way. Like you know, if you ever, if you ever, I, I wish I had the, uh, I, I wish I had the, the the DMs from back then. They've unfortunately been deleted mm. because I blocked the guy, and I've obviously I turned my DMs off from that particular point, or I turned my DMs to closed, and only people that I'm following. So I, I, I looked at that, and and and. But the thing about the, when I did my first on-camera appearance, like the DMs that I got, there was one guy who just absolutely railed me for, for no reason it wasn't like my casting or anything like that like he was saying making like shit about my appearance insinuating that i was a transsexual homophobic racist remarks apparently i was i'm, 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 I'm you know I'm, i was an italian piece of shit you know with some like really really <laughs> weird italian slurs which i never heard of in my life but apparently they're slurs and uh, i don't even know where that comes from because my background is, is from lebanon you know my racial background is from lebanon so i don't even know where italy comes from but also insinuating that you know i'm a tranny piece of shit and i should either go ahead and come out as gay as all the rest of my mates will go jump off a bridge you know that's not pleasant but that's what you get for being a public figure you know that's what we have to deal mm. with that's what players have to deal with and if you can't take the heat well what else can i say other than get out of the kitchen at this point and it's yeah. you know casters and analysts will never ever be you know mean for the sake of being mean you know we always have a point to make with our stuff because that's what we do we point out flaws we point out main you know advantages and you know we, we we do stuff you know we 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 make those points for the sake of you know, for, for the sake of bettering players we do it for the sake of bettering the scene you know that's the whole point of what an analyst does and the idea that someone should just cut out his criticism because it's a little bit mean it's like you're you're limiting yourself as a player if you think that 
Wasn't it Shogun, actually? I think it was yesterday or earlier today. Put out a tweet saying he really wants an angry sort of really yes, he did negative that. And Scottish the first, Do you know who the first fucking person people were atting was? <laughs> it, it was, was Danny. Danny. <laughs> it was Danny. Like, <laughs> that's what he did. And everyone hated him for it. And it's just that sort of case of, you know... The talent in Rocket League, everyone knows it needs to happen. But as soon as people try and get those bits working, the community knocks them down. And as a caster, you do have to accept that you're just going to get these weird, horrible little gremlin trolls DMing you, making fun of your appearance, making fun of that, saying you're a shit caster. And it's just like, I'm, I'm going to block you. If you actually have a legit like reason what's not going well with the cast... I will fully take that on board, but literally just making fun out of me saying, "Oh, we can you you've got shit curtains and all of that sort of thing." You're like, <laughs> yeah. "Okay, buddy, I think you, you. I'm not gonna say anything because there's clearly something going on in your own life, and you're just trying to vent. You know, trying to have this as an outlet. So you know what? You do you. I'll take the hit because I'm not too bothered. I'm a big enough person to deal with that. That is how it is, and it is just." It, after a lot of time, it does break you down. Don't get me wrong, but it's generally when you've had a bad day that it does break you down. Like we've we're our own harshest critics. Like we know when we've had a bad cast. I can remember that like the longest uh, competitive game, the um, Vitality versus Dignitas one back on uh, the play. I absolutely hate myself because my casting during that was ass. But the reason why it was so ass is because the players were doing this really long complacent play style which is just natural because they're trying to play a game of endurance but it's not fun the cast you're not going to get a good commentary out of it because there's nothing good to commentate on <laughs> and it's the casters that get the shit for it not the players for trying to one up and it's just that case of the community have all had like rcs has been absolutely nuts and all of that so when it gets to this level and this is what natural game players like you know we there was uh one during the what's it uh i think crafters had to deal with it at the weekend him and face uh mouse versus xeno moon and the whole comments for after a long time you actually saw the guys that understood what was going on and went this is actually more like a real game of football because they only care about getting one goal and that is it they'll part the bus they're done the comments, like, afterwards was more like, the castle were there, like, that felt more like a game which no one wanted to win. And it's just because we're so used to winning Rocket League to goals, 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 tons of them. So that when teams start playing this very safe, quite boring play style, it's the casters that have to sort of try and make that hype when it's hard to make, you know, it's hard to polish a turd, essentially, you know? <laughs> Are you insinuating that all the players from last night were fucking shit? <laughs> no, no. I'm just saying the <laughs> spectacle of it because the actual play style made complete and utter sense. <clears throat> it like f their play style was like th there's a reason to it, and it's just them playing safe. Like I said, you get a goal, you get two, and they're evaluating their opponents, going, "Okay, we don't want to push this because we could overcommit, so we're just going to play this nice and safe." That's logical for the players on the pitch, but for those at home, they look at that and get bored. Thus, the commentator gets the punishment for it. They get all the criticisms because they're the ones that are meant to make it, you know, lively, meant to make it hype. But when there is literally nothing hype going on, it's hard for a commentator to go hype. And rest assured, it's those critics are the ones that we really need to be going after more than the critics yeah. on the camera, right? Because you, 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 the, the players, they, you, they've got the fans, right? We don't have any of that shit. Like, you know, like I, I don't know, you know, I, I know that people obviously generally say, oh, we have some good casters in Rocket League. I think I've maybe got one major fan in Frostbite, but that's like about it, essentially. <laughs> like, when you, you look know, at, I, I, like I, when I, people I, talk about the RCS casters, when they talk about Final Carpet, it's not about how he can just liven up, and he doesn't put any good analysis on but he's a fantastic color caster because he makes it fun no you don't look at that they just go oh it's the guy with the beard and that's what frustrates me is it's more the whole community in rock league is not so much about the casters but about like just personality and more about well, i mean to be, to be, them to be as fair, an image that's to be, to be fair in, in in fairness in, in fairness right that is pretty natural for esports to have like people gravitate to the players more than anything else you know like you know like, like when it when it comes to it when it comes to a, a player versus caster thing the player is always going to win when it comes to the when it comes to the eye of public perception that's just the way it goes because the players are the ones playing they're the ones that are good at the 
game. That's the one that everyone, th those are the guys that oh, everyone's yeah. looking up to because, you know, everyone's playing Rocket League. Everyone wants to be the best in Rocket League. And when you're not the best in Rocket League, you, you gravitate to, to a personality, a guy or a person who is. And, and that's just the way it works in general. So like, you know, pro players, they got it. They, they got it easy compared to casters, right? It's like, you know, trust me, we got more problems to worry about than you guys thinking that we were overly critical. Because trust me, like, you know, you, you, could, you could learn a thing or two from the things that we said on broadcast. Again, we don't make a point unless we don't make, say something unless there's a point to be made about it. That's just the general point and just a general sort of way to like you know, say my piece on the whole thing about casting in Rocket League and, 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 and you know, about, you know, negativity, quote unquote, on a broadcast, you know? Mm. And what I was basically saying is that, like, the pe public opinion isn't more praising casters for what they're doing right. It's more just about their personality and more memes, if anything. Rocket League hasn't got to the stage where you... You've got the public being analytical and going on. Like, I can remember one of the uh, funniest things back in the day. It was during, like, a Rival Cup or whatever. And the whole, like, Twitch chat was going, oh, they're just saying really simple stuff and all of that. And, like, oh, you've got to get a goal to win that. And then the actual pro, pro players came in and were just like, they're actually telling a very good point. You, you're just, like, memeing it, but... You know, they're not pushing enough, thus then, like, you know, not going into offense enough, they're being too defensive, uh, X, Y, and Z team. So they're not able to get those goals. And it's sort of being glossed over. And that's what I'd say is the problem with um, the community at the moment towards commentators is that they're not trying to, they're not at the level. Rock League isn't developed enough for that the community look at it in the same way, in such an analytical way. When you look at CS or League of Legends, the, a lot of viewers are very hardcore into it, and so we'll look at it analytically as well, and then try themselves to take points away and how they can improve themselves. You don't get that as much in Rocket League. Yeah, uh, certainly. You know, I, I can't even. You know, I, I can't. I can't disagree. I can't. Uh, you know, agree with you more. To be honest. Uh, so, and actually, I'm going to say that's probably a reason why we've seen the number of casters drop off. It's because there's less people sort of like looking at it analytically and thus wanting to go on and do analysis and to become casters. Like we know from our scene, like in Europe, like there has been near enough no one signed up to become casters at the moment. Absolutely, like for 100%. Like it is, again, we've addressed this problem a couple of times in the past. We said, look, there is a problem with casters and the lack thereof. Again, you know, th these are these are things that need to be addressed when it comes to the, the casting scene and the current level of, of, of commentators that we have uh, in Rocket League. But you know, I think I think we've banged on about this for a little bit of time, Bacon. We still yeah, have one more. Yeah, probably a bit too long. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> probably we have a, we have a little bit more mailbag to do, and of course, talking about our results for this week. So again, thank you very much for us for the very intriguing questions. Thank you very much for bringing your Counter Strike knowledge uh, into the forefront. But now we're going to move on to a much more uh, endemic, I guess you could say, uh, Rocket League personality. In Shoxito, Mr. Leaf Esports himself. Did you, I heard Bacon, by the way. They're going to be picking up a Counter-Strike team. Did you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've heard rumors of this. The uh, team's castle curse might have actually got a big daddy sponsor or something. <laughs> <laughs> If you're not part of the Discord, you really should join because that's the kind of shit that we got. That's the kind of in jokes that you uh, you you'll miss out on. CS uh, viewer games, essentially. That is it. <laughs> <laughs> but Trox asks, why do you think Rocket League isn't a stream game? Current top streamers so get around 800 answer. to 1,500 viewers on prime time when it's a tournament with high caliber teams. It is. Too, is it too simple to understand the, or lacks? Uh, is it too simple to understand or lacks the strategical depth? How could it be improved? Or do streamers just lack, lack personality? And I'm going to start by saying I think it's a combination of that plus a few other factors, like a combination of mm. all of those things, you know, like probably not too simple to understand because it is simple to understand. And that's what makes it attractive. If anything, that sort of element has it has a bit more of the opposite effect that people are drawn into Rocket League because it is such a simple it's car football. You know, that's the that's the end of the day. It's car football. And that's all you really need to uh, um and that's all you really need to like pull from the uh, you know, that's all you really need to pull from the fucking um you know, uh, from, from 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 the concepts of the game, you know. So, strategical depth is something that only the really hardcore viewers get into. That's that's the, that, you know, when you get into strategical depth, that's when you start listening to podcasts like this, where you mm -hmm. really want to know more about the game from a much more in-depth perspective. When you want to know about the players from an in-depth perspective, you know, that's where you're drawn to. When it comes to streamers, though, like I think it's I I, I think that their main issue is going to be you know personality and current trends because current trends don't include Rocket League and personality has always been a problem in the scene, I think. Well, when Rocket League first came out, it was getting like 20 odd thousand viewers, uh, you know, in, whatchamacallit, on Twitch, Twitch page. Yeah. And we'll see that every now and then when people like, say, Lyric or whoever 
fancies playing Rocket League because a lot of like you know big streamers that do like Rocket League as a game, but it's just one of those which they know they won't gain sort of like viewership or followers and all of that from it's purely them playing it because they want to have it fun that's why they'll put it on like a variety stream friday or whatever you know streamers do within rock league itself because it's down to if there's not Cronovi, you know who or rizzo who will bring in like 2000 of viewers because that's who they are uh, people will tune in purely from them uh, you'll have anywhere from like 2,000 odd viewers just watching Rocket League. And that's because that's the sort of like hardcore Rocket League community wanting to watch that anytime. Because your more casual viewers are more interested in following up with the trends like Apex coming out. Everyone is bloody watching that. Like I can literally go on Twitch right now and see on browse, Apex is the highest viewed um game with over 200,000 viewers on it behind that is just chatting because i don't know this is middle of the day for us so that's probably a lot of uh korean you know just chatting shows and that's just how yep. twitch works league of legends is always up there fortnite has you know waves upon waves of 12 year olds watching that dota <laughs> is always going to be around PUBG is a long staple now because that's how it is with the whole battle royale genre and then cs after that and I mean, we can look at CSJ and know how much that has dropped off. Viewership for CS has dropped off by like half over the last year and a half, two years, hasn't it? Like it's had a massive hit to it. And that's just the natural progression of it. Rocket League is not the hit new game, so it's not going to be up top. It's always going to have, at the moment, I just looked at it, 4,000 viewers. Guess what? Rizzo is streaming. He's got 1.3 thousand viewers to it. The second is the rerun of DreamHack. After that is Marky Duda and bloody hell, Mark is streaming. That's a once in a blue moon thing. I also love how this fucking title of that stream is Old Man Marky Retires, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it is confirmed unofficially breaking news on the <laughs> Aftershock stream. <laughs> no. Coincidence, all... Marky Duda retires. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it, 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 at the end of the day, like, you know, it's it. That's one of the most one of the most staunch factors, I think, is the fact that everyone is drawn to Apex and they are drawn to the big to the big games. Mm. But here's the thing, right? Rocket League doesn't have to be a big sort of like trendy game to succeed. You know, you've seen how many fucking viewers the uh, uh, the esports stuff gets. You know, it certainly could be an esports based sort of uh, uh, sort of video game. And you take a look at those top games you mentioned, you're just listing off right there: Apex Legends, League of Legends, Fortnite, Dota, PUBG, Counter Strike. And going a little bit further down the list, you've got StarCraft and Hearthstone are also within that sort of like top like 10 region of uh, 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 mm. of, of, of topics being streamed on Twitch right now. And you notice that the games there are either big trends or big pedigree, right? And obviously the big trends are always going to win out because everybody's fucking hype. On, uh, the hype train is really rowing when they're in the massive growth stage. Eventually it'll mature and then it will sort of like level out at a certain level after it declines for a certain period of time. And certainly that's where Counter-Strike and Dota are currently listed at right now because they are sort of like after that, after that you know, main hype train has kicked off many many years ago now they've gotten to dropped a little bit and they've leveled out to a point where the community is stable right mm -hmm. and the thing about rocket league is that it could possibly reach that point where it is a bit of a mature style game and certainly it's been out for enough years i think it's, it's been out for a few years now like i yeah, said it's, 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 it's minimum stable right two thousand four thousand is about the average i think yeah, I mean, it's stable right now. I think the main issue is that people look at it, they compare it to Apex and they compare it to Counter-Strike and it's like, why aren't we getting that many viewers? And that's where I think the issue with personality comes in because everyone says the one thing that Rocket League needs the most is some personality. We need some trash talk. We need some people that are coming up and they're going to be, you know, fucking, they're going to be the most entertaining streamers. They're going to be the most entertaining personalities on interviews, you know. And that's part of what I want to do with Aftershock at some point in time because our little uh, special project is starting to come along. I don't know if you're aware of this, Bacon, mm -hmm. but we have, uh, um, uh, you know, our graphics are coming along just fine, uh, and uh, I'm also going to be reaching out to our first uh, special guest of the year, uh, just to give you a little hint of what we're going to be going and doing uh, over the course of Aftershock over the rest of 2019. Uh, you know, it's slow progress, but the progress is coming along, so uh, you, you can sort of like see. You, you, you can sort of see, like, you know, wh wh like, wh where things need to go in terms of, like, you know, media training, personality sort of, like, building up, you know. Obviously, we're gamers, so we're going to be awkward. But even in the context of something like Counter-Strike, like, you know, the personalities in Rocket League, they don't fucking mount up to Counter-Strike or the FGC mm. sort of scene, you know? And you see, like, just... Taking Counter Strike as the example, because you know the whole uh, Kavitz and stuff going on at the moment, the awkwardness comes down when it's generally an interview on stage. You know, uh, Frank is just there, like with uh, one of the Navi players who don't speak great English, but they're trying to get the sort of trash talk going because they know it's good for image, it's good, it's good for entertainment, all of that sort of jazz. Whereas when you go to Rocket League, we're starting to get that like 
a little bit advanced, but it's generally more just like, you know, Turbo Pulsar going, oh, no, we're win. We're win because we're the best team. That's a yeah, good I'll start, buddy. Yeah, Ferrari after we but win I, the next season, yeah, the RSCS, I want you to example, trash you know? the other team. Just say literally why they're trash and your mechanics are going to do better because X, Y, or Z, and boom, we've done that. The problem is you can't just say, like, one player's got to do that. Every player has to do it. And near enough, the whole sort of entertainment aspect of it is everyone's just got balls that are bigger than what they should really have. And they've near enough got to try and big themselves up, saying they're the best thing, you know, since sliced bread, when realistically, they're going to get knocked down. That's just how it is. People will make hmm. fun, you know. The whole um, Chief Slayer thing with classics, that was funny, but no one's going to say that now. You know, the only sort of continued meme from it was just, oh, if you can't beat them, take their best player in Drippe. That's funny as fuck. And it gets more people behind EG and sort of laughing and memeing about it because, you know, all memes help in that sort of regard to viewership and, like, personality to the team. And then also, you know, fans watching. So... It's just one of those things. Players need to stop being such wet blankets in that regard, you know? <laughs> They're all well and good on Twitter talking shit, but when it actually comes to LAN interviews or... And that streaming sort of as well, you know, like the, the thing about streaming as well is that it's such a big platform for anyone to say whatever they want, and that shit can like trend in s as soon as possible. Mm. If you get like a really good hot take and people agree with you, then that shit's you know th that's going to take off, and you're going to get a lot more traction on your streams. You're going to get a lot more traction for Rocket League in general, you know, and and that's something that people seem to miss out on quite a lot. You know, that like, we have you know what what are the main things that sort of like come up when you think about like Twitch clips? You have like Turbo Pulse's fucking um, Mutley laugh from when he was you know reacting to. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, we was reacting to that to the uh, qualifier result of Vitality dropping to PSG, you know, the shit like that. And obviously the, the the big drama scares whenever someone makes a hot take about a team or leaks something in regards to that. That's what gets traction going. So, you know, and, and it kind of ties back into the point we we're talking about with Danny and, we, and with casters also, you know, having negative impressions because that also further extends to the community and extends also to the players. And it's like, you know, negativity when used correctly is not a bad thing, right? It's not... Mm. It's, it's, it's not a terrible thing when, especially when you want to be a little bit cocky, you want to be like, you know, like uh, you want to make jabs at your uh, teammates, you know, if there's a point to it, then yeah, you know, like, again, what are the top memes? Players digging into each other, you know? Fucking it was why, like scrub we say, killer, always, scrub, mock you know, there's, it there's, being there's, back there's, on side was a good thing because they were the bad guys and it actually made entertainment out of Rocket League. Absolutely, you know, like you know, it doesn't have to be like a, a, a real bad guy. You don't have to be right. a mocket being, you know, the, the scum lords of the scene, you know. But like, <laughs> if you play the character of the bad guy, then that it, that makes entertainment, you know. I think what was it? Is a, is a great is a great sort of uh, a great uh, what was it? Um, quote from WWE. I've recently been watching a lot of old, old WWE clips, uh, mm. and one of the managerial staff sort of like characters on screen said, you know, controversy creates cash, and it's it's it's, it's true, you know, it does, you know. Yep. What 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 gets the click? controversial things you know what gets the what gets the memes what gets the people's public attention you know stuff like scrub killer saying i'm never going to lose to psg in all 2019 and the first match he does is fucking you know <laughs> he, he takes like the biggest loss of his fucking career you know like this shit like that where it's like you know that's funny that generates attention that generates clicks that generates viewership overall and it's stuff implementing that into streamers into esports levels into everything when it comes to rocket league media that's what's going to be able to push things part further and that's what's going to allow viewership to grow on rocket league as a whole. I can't add anything more to that. That, Perfect. that is then, pretty much it. And <laughs> we can move on to our tournament roundup. Again, I want to say thank you to Frostbite and Trox for sending in your questions. Again, if you want to send in a question on the podcast, you can go to the description and the show notes of the video and audio versions of the podcast and click that link to the Discord channel, Discord server, where you can chat to our small community of awesome EU fans of the Rocket League esports scene. And you can send us a question via the mailbag channel, which is open to everybody. So... Let's talk about our tournaments because there was only really one major tournament to talk about, and that is the rival eSports Winter Open for the European mm -hmm. region. There is an open qualifier and a final bracket. We're not going to be covering the open qualifier because there's too many things to talk about. There's too many teams and, you know, the standard sort of like bubble insecurities, the bubble sort of like instability where some teams just like, okay, well, we expect them to go through and then they didn't. Um, you know, we, we certainly could have made a podcast out of that alone. So we're only mm. going to focus mostly on the final bracket. And for those of you who don't know how the final bracket went, it was Xeno Moon or Xeno Moon in in the uh, uh, finals against Flipside Tactics, they won a four to three series after beating Mouse Sports and also taking a forfeit victory against Renault Vitality. And that's where I'm going to start things off right here. 
<laughs> See, this in, is, uh... in a way, I want to gloss over this because it's such a hurt. Like, I, it's so dumb. I don't know why this shouldn't happen. Like, we've looked at all the tweets, and the reason was, as like people have put out on Twitter, was K Dot was at the gym, Jay, and why? Just it makes no sense, does it? No. No, it doesn't, Bacon. Of course, it fucking doesn't. I'm uh, I'm, I'm not a happy boy about this, my dude. I'm. <laughs> pretty fucking not because no. here's the thing right previously i had a bit of a moan of bubble scene teams during the renegade cup because i was like look you know if you if you don't turn up for tournaments if you don't sign up to the opportunities that have been given to you by the community organizations and by psionics then these tournaments will go away right it happened with the weeklies and mm -hmm. yeah certainly you know weekly is a bit of a different thing because obviously that's very expensive to run and there's very little return Something like a monthly, however, you know, even that runs at a loss, but a lot less of a margin compared to the uh, compared to the weekly tournaments that we used to have before. So, and not to mention, this is also something I had with the last rival tournament that we had. What was it? The uh, um, was it the spring or the or the or the, or the autumn, autumn? The fall open? Yeah, the autumn yeah. open. Yeah, where it was some invited teams decided they're going to turn down in the in in, in the closed qualifier, which is like okay, fine, closed qualifier. That's still pretty shitty of you, you know, turn up for your tournament. This time, a top team in the world decided, fuck it, we're not going to go ahead and do this. And fair enough enough k -Dot was at the gym if he got the call and managed to get himself down back over very quickly we probably could have delayed the matches i know that from talking to the guys behind the scenes at rival they were like yeah that probably could have been possible but my also understanding is that they had a sub signed up for this tournament and they still didn't want to use him on Renault vitality even if they want only to play that quarterfinal then bring you know k-dot back for the semi-finals and that's just like that is the most unprofessional fucking thing I've seen out of an RLCS team since Mockets, basically. Like, mm -hmm. fucking hell. That is just ridiculous. That is just... That is... And it, of course, it is fucking That's Mocket a middle because... finger. That is what it is. Exactly. It is, it, is, it is exactly what I mentioned about the Autumn Open. It is a slap to the face of rival esports because this is not sponsored by Sonyx. It's not even sponsored at all. These guys have funded it off their own fucking back so they can contribute to the Rocket League scene and your cunt ass is going to decide, yeah, we're going to go and just not turn up to a tournament that we've accepted the invite for. Like, just... What an example to set to the teams below you, you know, right? Mm. You know, I, 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 you know, what an example is that like, we can forfeit and we'll still be a top team in the world. It'd be fantastic. And obviously, you know, I, I think the response from the rest of the community has been fantastic. Like Tylacta put out a tweet saying, you know, imagine accepting an invite for a tournament that everybody else has to qualify for and then just not even showing up, which I'm glad that that generally tends to be the sentiment from the rest of the scene players because, like, it's absolutely true. Like, just turn up. If you're going to accept, put it in your diaries, put it in your planners, turn up and make sure it happens otherwise so, you just look like an unprofessional and that's what it is it's unprofessional and the problem at the moment in rock league is that if we want and definitely the players do want more tournaments want say rival to put more of you know their rival weeklies or just put on you know five thousand dollar cups and said just one thousand ones which i can understand players of this level probably don't care so much about the one thousand sort of dollar prize pool it's good for them in two ways anyway, like that flip side PSG game. It's good competition practice and actual real conditions, which is good for them. But secondly, they're getting invited to this higher level purely because we like as tournament organizers, we know they don't like they can't be asked to do with that. So we're sort of like going to middle ground. It's good for us to get these big teams on board purely because the name's there, so you'll get viewership in. And at the end of the day, we know the struggle within Rocket League for tournament orgs is actually getting sponsorship. So what do you do? You get big teams in. Big teams then will get more viewership in. Thus, with more sh viewership, you can go to sponsorships and say, we're getting this viewership number. you be able to support the prize pool there. We'll be able to get this much. And that's good for your advertisement. So when the second in line, you know, we're putting on the tournament, 1,000 prize pool, the second in line, the teams can't be bothered to show up then you're not going to get the viewership. Thus, you're not going to get the sponsors come through, and thus, you're not going to get the growth within the Rocket League scene. A lot of growth in Rocket League at the moment relies upon teams such as Vitality, Mouse, Flipside, PSG, the list goes on, Dignitas and all of that, to show up for these events. Thus, Rival can grow, Rewind can grow, Rocket Baguette can grow, Nexus, whatever over in the NA side of things, because that is what is needed to go to the next point. $1,000 at the moment is the best you're going to get out of a tournament. 
on a regular monthly basis. But six months down the line, we don't want that. We want it to be 5,000, don't we, Jay? It, but it's not going to happen if players are just dropping out, not showing up for this, because if players don't have the faith there, then if a sponsor looks into it just a little bit deeper in numbers and see that teams can't be asked, then that's bad for their image as well. And it, it, it's shooting yourself in the foot. That is what it is at, at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah. Couldn't even describe it any further. You know, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You look unprofessional. You set back everybody else as a result. You know, again, it's not cheap to run these tournaments. I made the rant about it in the Renegade Cup. There ain't no money involved in doing community organization stuff. Like, you know, I ain't been paid for fucking anything since the Ember series in Rocket League. You know, mm. that, that, you know there's, 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 there's nothing else other than running a good tournament. And if the teams can't show up for it, it's like, that's the most demoralizing thing. You know, you've got big squads. Yeah, we have our mouse sports. We have Flipside. We have PSG. We have Renault Vitality. What's that? Renault Vitality aren't coming? fuck's sake you know after and the thing about tournament invites is that the thing, 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 thing that people don't have to understand about tournament invites is that it takes a time for these things to come in place you need to reach out beforehand mm -hmm. schedule things make sure that everything sort of lines up with those guys and to make sure that you have yourself you know a solid sort of like defined lineup and you know that they're going to turn up so for this shit to happen last second like it it, it, it just demonstrates one of them again it's one of my big pet peeves about rocket league play your fucking tournaments just play them right just fucking play them what else are you doing you're at the gym okay great get your ass back over to home right now play the fucking tournament play the fucking game your gym well, can she wait said, there's a sub there so literally, a, that's, the sub that's the best is thing the best point that's the for other this. thing that triggers me the most as well again Give Kate up a call. I can't make it in time. Okay, we'll play with our sub for the quarterfinals. Get here for the semis as soon as you can, you know? That's how it's done. That's the point of bringing a sub on board, but I'm told they didn't want to do that. And that's the other thing as well. It's like, you. it, it shows to me, not only that you are you unprofessional in accepting a tournament like this, you're also just, you also just don't care about a tournament like this. Well, and it's it, also again, disrespect to their sub that they don't think it's worth playing with them. What's the point in having a fucking sub then? How does the sub feel knowing that they don't want to play in this tournament because KDOP's not there and they don't want to play with you? What's the point of you being a sub for that team if they just don't respect you like that? It's just all... It's all just a load of wank. That's what it is. I'm just fucking, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm just really so tired of complaining about shit like this. Like, you know, mm. I say the same thing week in and week out, and it's like, I, I've said it before. If you don't support these tournaments, they will go away, right? If you do not, if you do not help rival esports run EU tournaments, then they will disappear. That's the same thing with Rewind Gaming. You don't support those tournaments, they disappear. You don't support the Renegade Cup, that will disappear. Psionics are already having problems, and the rest of the bubble scene as well are already having problems trying to see if they can support the bubble scene as a whole. And if you keep doing shit like this, then you're gonna have then then there's just gonna be nothing. There will just be nothing. We've already lost the Gfinity weeklies. Those are gone now. So you've got so what's what's left? There is the monthlies. There are the small tournaments that the community organizations won. All right. Don't turn up for those. Don't respect those guys. What happens next? There's nothing else. There's nothing mm -hmm. else. There's no other fucking tournaments, you know? And that's the one thing that Rocket League is missing the most, these small grassroots organizations. So when big teams come up and they do do things like that, you know, sponsors don't get confident because obviously you can't bring those in because if a big team forfeits at the last second, well, shit, you know, what does that say about the tournament organizer? What does that say about the tournament itself, you know? Yes, I know they don't have any control over it, but that's not how the sponsor thinks. You know, if they are sold a tournament based on the fact that Renault Vitality are going to be there, then they expect Renault Vitality to be there. And you set back an entire scene based off of this. You know, this wouldn't happen in the RLCS because it's top tier competition. So why is this not getting the same respect? Because it's a thousand dollars, thousand euros. Don't sign up then. Don't accept the invite. You accepted the invite though, so you've got no excuse. Like fuck, I'm just I'm I'm, mm. I'm so frustrated with the way that European teams tend to treat these things because it's not a luxury, right? Like Rocket yep. League Esports is teetering on the edge, right? We don't have massive infrastructure. If you forfeit a game in something like CSGO, then, okay, fair enough, because there's always another tournament tomorrow. There's always another tournament next week. You know, there's always going to be something else for you. In Rocket League, that is objectively, objectively not true. And it pisses me off when people don't take these things. They don't take these opportunities. You set yourselves back. You set everybody else back. It's a very selfish thing to do. So fuck you for it. I think we need to cut it there and just move on to the next bit because we are running out of time on the podcast, Jay. So let, let's actually get on to the yeah. positives of the tournament and talking about it there. 
Let's do that. Of course, there was an actual tournament going down. I hope that my frustrations can fucking end sometime soon so we can continue to talk about these results because it was a very interesting tournament regardless, mm. you know. I did the open qualifiers, but you did the main tournament, Bacon. In fact, you got the grand finals between Zeno Moon and Flipside Tactics. You also got the Flipside Tactics versus PSG Esports. And of course, that's going to be great because we're going to be talking about those two teams quite a lot, a little bit. Uh, but I just want to start with the bubble scene because obviously Zeno Moon making it to the finals and winning the tournament and Exalty also taking a couple of games off of Flipside Tactics. Like, you know, know it's just building on top of the the momentum that the bubble scene has already been able to establish during the course of dreamhack open oh sorry mm. a dreamhack pro circuit i should say you know with, with those guys being able to do as well as echo zulu and obviously exalty going as toe-to-toe -to -toe against flipside tactics you know that's pretty it's, it's pretty fucking bald all things considered yeah it's looking good at the moment the bubble scene is showing that once again eu depth we've got it we've got tons of great players zeno moon really coming out of nowhere and keep building upon building upon building fantastic see and they earned that victory like i said it earlier the xenomoon against mouse sports was a very it, it <laughs> we used the joke it felt like a game that no one wanted to win but it's purely because everyone's playing defensive not wanting to get goals that's strategy against flip side was a little bit of a uh, different one later we'll talk about that when we get to the grand finals sort of like talk but xenomoon are building up and they are doing the work this is what this tournament is really aimed at is more practice for these bubble teams to go through the qualifiers especially before rlrs plans and get that practice and then go against these super high level teams which are going to be the toughest opponents and you're going to learn the most from xeno moon are doing the work and they are showing some great effort towards it and this is a team which i have high hopes for now well, I, I want to talk about them in a bit more depth when it comes to the final performance against Flipside because I want to move on to mouse spots very quickly um, because they're looking a little bit shaky at the moment, I'm afraid, Bacon. That's I can't nicely. really... I was putting it nicely, yeah. I mean, I did a bit of VOD review. I watched them, the what the them versus whatever series, and you'll notice that even though it was a three to one, all the goals or all the games were within one goal, mm. right? It was one zeros, two ones... And that was it, you know, it was like, you know, so fucking defensively played and they have barely any striking element. And I fear that this serious lack of offensive pressure is going to put them in relegation for the next RLCS season. Like, it really feels like shit's going to... I would put money on them getting demoted next season because it, that is the way it's been. This is a squad that is not of RLCS caliber and they don't know how to fix it. They thought bringing in a lot as very strong sort of captain role would be able to do it, but we've said it all along. It was not the right move, Jay. Yeah, no, it was not the right move. You know, they, they needed to keep that, you know, they need to keep some sort of like pressure play because there was none of that right there. You know, as you were mm. saying, you know, neither team wanted to win. So I felt like Mouse Balls didn't want to win against Zeno Moon. Um, if I recall correctly, actually, it was Zeno Moon, the ones that was putting some serious the distance between them and Mouse Sports uh, throughout the course of their series. As you know, they were, you know, again, trading blows back and forth. Mouse Sports weren't able to keep up with the offensive that Zeno Moon were able to play, which, by the way, they played really, really well this weekend oh, yeah. when it came to offensive play. So when you have issues with that, when you have a play team that are so good in the offensive, you know. You gotta look at Savage, for example. They're in the next season, the RLCS. Is Mouse Sports gonna be able to cope with that when they've got no offensive that they can put up with their own right? You know, we don't know. I don't really think so, to be honest. Like this team is every time we see Mouse Sports, they are looking worse and worse as the weeks go on. Mm. And I, I really just feel sorry for Mouse Sports picking up, you know, Savage Geneva back in the day, and they looked good. I mean, the first season, like they did well getting through to i think it, they did come out sixth but you know they've just been promoted up and i was a big fan of them can you remember Jay, me saying they're like they've done well this first season they'll be able to advance from it in the next kicking skyline was the wrong move they should have kept like building upon that and then getting in a lot there is no strong single attacker there's not a i want to say you know a speed aspect to it there's not a um a fruity sort of player or a chore set there. There's no single person which you could say is a strong striker. They're all very much midfield players, and that is wrong. The roles within this team, like the chemistry ain't going to form because the team's not right for each other. And I, I don't know why they went with a lot. It just felt really weird. We know from every single result that it is not working, and yet... They're pretty much locked in now. You know, signing a lot yeah. onto the contract means that Mouse aren't going to want to drop him. Uh, his contract probably be in line with the rest of the contracts for the other players because that's quite often how you do it. 
But if a lot was to get kicked from the team, uh, Mouse Sports would have to pay him sort of like a leaving fee as such. You know, severance just, tie, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Compensation And for it's like, it. especially when you consider they've already bought the contract out from Complexity. It's like, you know, imagine the money sink it would be to get yep. him out of the lineup right now. Like, fucking hell. Like, where, where do we go with Mouse Sports from here? Like, I imagine there must be change on the horizon for next season. But like for this season, it's it's not looking good. It, it really ain't looking good for the... For the uh, for for the, for that squad, I just I just don't know where you go from here. Literally, it, the saddest thing for me is it like saying it can only go up. That is how bad they have gotten, you know. So, I mean, there is still a potential that they can, they can still go down. I mean, let's, 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 I mean, let's they not can go down lightly. to RLRS, yes, but they can like we're we're going into RLCS this next season right and we're expecting them to lose every single game probably go zero to seven that's how it is for them to get a game is them beating expectations because that's the level they're at now so they have to improve and like you know what i'm saying about getting a single strong striker yeah they've got junior as the sub now this is the weirdest most probably bullshit left like like out of left comment to make but that is his play style i would actually prefer looking at this roster getting junior who has not even played in an rl rs match to replace one of the three on the side just purely because they've got a very attacking solo striking player on that roster and that is me being super harsh right now because nothing is working for that team yeah i mean to be honest, i can't even i can't even i can't even debate that one like i think that that honestly would just be an improvement to have junior who is yeah obviously we saw him during the dream qualifiers how fucking you know insane he was working with breezy you know, yeah, he's two... an inconsistent player sure. like we will throw our hands up and say that but if they were able to get him in form over the next month get him comfortable it would be an upgrade, and that's really bloody weird to say when it's Alex Tigre and a lot who they're all fucking nuts players, aren't they? But together, they're yeah. shite. Exactly. Like you know, they 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 don't feel like it. again. It's not that the talents are, are terrible. It's just the fact that the formation is wrong. It's wrong in any in, in in every way. I think. And again, I feel like that someone like Junior, who yeah, as you mentioned, is inconsistent. He has that striking element. You know, if he, if they brought him up, they used him on the main roster, like. I think if there's a point where he does sub in for a team and he oh, does sub in for the team and he does manage to find a, a, a match during the RLCS, I feel like that will really prove the concept for Mouse Sports right there. That mm. you know, maybe maybe it was maybe it wasn't a great idea to bring in a lot. Maybe it is time we get some striking element right there. You know, because if you have that midfield player who rotates to the defense, you block it off, keep that pressure, allow juniors to get some stupid backboard touch, and boom, there you go. You know, that that that's that's the theoretics of sort of like being having junior in a team like this. And I think that it would work better for Mouse sports if they had him on the main roster and again I, I think that from a business perspective they don't want to do that because there's just so, so much money into getting a lot into the lineup and then it's, it's going to bite them in their ass come the season's end you know yeah and again can you remember before the whole a lot getting picked up all that sort of thing I, and we first heard that Skyrim was leaving i was the one that said like at that point like why geez why that when you got savage coming up and they're an unorged team, you know. Surely you'd be trying to convince one of them because all three of them are very aggressive. Alpha, the least aggressive striking one out of a lot, but he's still a fantastic fucking striker. It's just he can be in defense at the same time, very much a uh, Cooksier esque player, you know, in that regard. Mm. And we were saying that's the sort of team which you're going to want to try and poach a player from. Triple Trouble work as a trio. They're not a single striker, yes, but they can all strike. They can all defend. Like, looking at the current lineup, Casio is the best striker on that team. Before, Speed was. So they all have their own little personal best areas, but they work as a free musketeer sort of form, which doesn't happen in mouse sports because they're all very much... You would want them as your anchor players. Tigre back in the day was a fantastic striking player, but he's fallen off, become a little bit more timid. And mm. it's just a really odd one to see. Mouse Sports, for me, I'm looking at it and going, they'll drop down next season and might do a player transfer. You know, like a player swap with another team to try and hopefully fix that. And if it's going to be with another team, it's probably going to be an RL RS team. Like, I'm looking if Method keep their roster, you know? where Rich yeah. one day 
uh, could be brought in for that or um Maybe they might get Oslo who's playing with Method now, you know, that would be, a, that that'd be a fun little, you know, the, again, the, the, that sort of thing will probably end up being, you know, the, the transfer that Mouse Sports would make um, because, mm -hmm. you know, like, again, I, I, I just can't see it working. You know, again, I, I feel there's serious issues with this one. I think we've kind of banged on about it for the most amount of time, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it does look like a dark, a dark era for the Mouse Sports squad at the moment. You know, again, they made semifinals, but they lost to Zeno Moon. No one predicted that, and you know it kind of starts to state the point of exactly where Mouse Sports stands. So let's move on to flip side um, because they are also a little bit disappointing in this one. I want to say, you know, I mean, they did come up against some pretty staunch, you know, p p opponents. You know, Exalty yeah. obviously were there, and they had a bit of a, a bit of a massive performance. PSG was there, and flip side struggled against them during the uh, uh, during the DreamHack Leipzig groups. Uh, and in this series, obviously, they went four to three over. You know, PSG were up at match point at three two over. Rule. So it took Flipside two games to reverse and go to the grand finals. Well, they still lost against Zeno Moon right there. So, so go for it. Uh, Flipside are a weird one because we didn't get to see the Flipside Exalt game, did we? It was just Mouse, whatever, and PSG Method were the ones on stream. So, Flipside Exalt are a bit weird. We don't know what happened there. But PSG Flipside, that was a fucking fantastic series, dude. Like, that was so nuts good. That's what you expect from these two teams. And credit to both, PSG played nuts. Um, unfortunately, they just crumbled at the end. Flipside were able to etch them out, but Flipside at the moment are PSG's like bogey team. Just that sort of play style PSG struggle against, and they have to adapt continuously against them. But in the finals, Flipside didn't show any respect. It, they got very complacent, didn't really fancy playing Rocket League. During the cast, I actually used the example of it was almost like they were eating their dinner whilst playing. Like, saying Flipside were playing shite in comparison, but it was because they weren't focusing, they weren't paying their full attention to the game. And the point being there is Flipside could play so much better, which they finally did when it came through to the SIP game. They really turned it up. And they got that SIP game, but they lost the seventh game to Xenomoon. And it all comes down to Xenomoon were, again, not playing brilliantly, but they, throughout the whole of it, were playing against a team that wasn't half arsed And when you've got a team that you're playing off against who you're expecting to make a clear, you're expecting to make a save, um, you know, a shot in certain directions, and they whiff it or they double commit, it throws you off against them because you're expecting Flipside to play fucking Flipside level of Rocket League, and they're not. And then finally, when they came into that SIP game, Xenomoon looked fucking amazing. You know, yeah. like, they were nuts good. And it's all because Flipside weren't really bothering during that first half of the series. And for me, it's a little bit like with Vitality. It shows a lack of professionalism because you should go into every single series trying to play your absolute best. Against Xenomoon, against Mouseport, Xenomoon had the problem of, uh, it was just a play style sort of like a mismatch in a sense, so both of them had to play defensively because that's how they just faced up against each other. That's strategy. Against Flipside, both rosters should be playing super aggressive, super fast, because again, that's the play style which both teams are best at. And it's just really weird to see that and how it all sort of like started just from Flipside, not really talking to each other, not really being bothered for it. Well, I mean, I, I did want. I mean, I, I do want to touch on your point about you know whether or not Flipside were you know caring that much, or whether they were like you know giving it their all. Because I do think they were giving it their all in that grand final performance, especially you know when you consider the sort of score lines that sort of came out from uh, Flipside and Zenomoon in that one. There were two overtimes, uh, one, two, three, four games out of the seven that came within one single goal. So I feel like it, it was just. A, I'm not sure whether it was just an off day or whether it was or whether you know. Cause I said in the, in the in the show notes, I think they were mm. a little flat, not a full level of like they don't care, sort of like you know, uh, you know, I mean, you know not 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 you, caring. You to watched that very series, well. dude, didn't you? I did watch that series. I Come did watch on, that series. They were not caring throughout the whole of it. There was very much points in the game where they went for the first four minutes. Uh, I think the best example was when they won 3-2 in game number four, I think it was, where they near enough went the first four minutes without scoring a goal and 
I'm trying. No, it wasn't. It was uh, in game number three. Sorry, they went the first four minutes without scoring a goal. Zenit Moon were two 0 up. Then flip side in that last minute, suddenly just took them into overtime, and they finally turned it on. Went into overtime and went complacent again. Zenit Moon played very good in that overtime. Don't get me wrong, but it was just very much in that style of when flip side wanted to turn it up, they could, but otherwise they didn't really bother. And it was really weird to see flip side being able to near enough turn on the switch, you know, actually put their foot down on the gas and play well. I don't know if they were tired after the whole long day, but it was well, that, really that, that, that was long. what I was going to say. That was what I was going to intimate. I was going to say, like, look, I think they might have been quite tired after playing two, like, down-to-the-wire series back-to-back, and obviously against PSG, a team that they've struggled against uh, on LAN and online, a team that, you know, we know to be like, an online powerhouse, especially. I feel like Flipside was just a little bit tired by the end of that one and getting into another <laughs> Game 7 series. It's just like, oh, Jesus. You know, and there's a part of me that doesn't want to believe that they, you know, that they, that they, didn't, that they didn't care enough or they got too complacent like certainly you know complacency is something that Zeno Moon was able to use to their advantage over the course of mm-hmm. this entire you know over the course of this entire tournament you know because obviously mouse sports didn't play that very offensively flip side tactics didn't play offensively of their own right I can agree with you on that one but I think there's more just down there. didn't even show up so that, that's <laughs> the max of it <laughs> the ultimate complacency right there from fucking vitality um but you know I am uh I mean, I, you know, I feel like it's 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 only a, it's only a little bit down to that complacency level and more oh. down to just fatigue from Flipside because we've seen that have a, a massive effect against uh, on teams in the past. Because you also got to consider as well is that Flipside they played the semi-finals and the finals back to back. Zenai Moon played Now Sports first, then they had a break for the Flipside series, which went to full seven games. So they had a lot of time to just sit down, and chill, and then come back into the next series with a fresh mind and a fresh sort of like way of approaching the game with also some research under their belt because they could have watched the stream and seen what Flipside are doing how they can exploit the, the, the line of that particular squad and I feel, feel like Zenimu had a bit of a technical advantage coming into that finals um, I you, don't you know don't I'm, I'm still saying no I think it was massive complacency because Flipside came into that and even with like you know using the whole ex- exhausted sort of I'm going to say excuse for it. They won the first two games of that and looked like they were going to be, be able to near enough half arse their way into a sweep. And it was finally Zenimoon being able to step it up because they worked out how to deal with a team that was just playing so damn weird. Because playing against a team that's very complacent, um, yet yeah, it was like controlled very much solo plays. Definitely in those first two games, Speed was fucking on form. Like he carried on through from that PSG match, that energy, that level. And then he sort of fell off with the rest of his team because he was the only one putting the actual work in. And Zenimoon were able to step it up. The difference is just there that Flipside needs to turn it up and Zenimoon just had learned over the time. So maybe it's a weird one like this was a good learning step for Zenimoon because they can hopefully now deal with a team that's complacent because they had to adapt to it. But... Yeah, it was all down to Flipside really not being there for the first half of the series. I'm not putting, like, saying, like, Xenomoon are a weak team in comparison. No, they played fucking brilliantly. It was just, you know, circumstances there. And so Xenomoon well and truly earned that finals. They were the better team there when you look at it. And it comes down to Flipside not like just not being there. It felt very odd. If these two were to play against, say, today... I would not expect Flipside to be complacent because they know how good Xenomoon can be now. So they wouldn't play that same sort of way and they would give them the full respect. To me, it just looked like Flipside turned up and just going, oh, this is a no-name team. They beat Mouse Sport, which they don't respect in the moment as well because it's Mouse Sports and we've just gone on about them. So they probably just thought this is going to be an easy one and we can half ass it. Probably you went off and watched Netflix whilst playing. You know, it's that sort of level, you know? So what, having dinner while playing the series and also and watching, watching Netflix. Netflix and chill with Rocket League. Fucking, you are just full of metaphors today, Bacon. Jesus. <sighs> Well, we can agree to disagree on that one. Again, I'm not 100% convinced, but we'll have to see how that works out for the rest of the tournament. I'm something just I think upset we can... because I expect more out of Flipside, you know? like. Well, something we can agree on, I think, Bacon, is mm-hmm. Zeno Moon, because these guys... Right, they have been on a tear lately. They had the massive performance mm-hmm. at the DreamHack qualifiers and making it so far as to face up against some top teams. And obviously the victory against Mouse Sports is a massive one. But the victory against Flipside is something pretty unprecedented for these guys. Mm-hmm. And the best part about it is that they didn't look like they half-assed it. I'm certainly convinced that they... Zenomin worked their butts off yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that they put 100% behind this tournament and 
you can see how it reaped the benefits of it right there. You know, a fucking victory for them in a minor tournament with some RLCS squads. You know, A right for them, yo. A win like this for them, I think that when it comes to RLRS, they could have a top four seed going into the qualifiers, which is massive when it comes down to RLRS. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't secure you a path to victory. But of course, it means, like, if I'm looking at MCON, um, Echo, Zulu, and Xenomoon are going to be one of your top four, like, they've all got top four seed. And if they're trying to avoid each other, like you do with the qualifiers, this should help them so damn much to be able to go on and succeed and get into RLRS next season, you know? Yeah, they're one of those teams that I'm looking at them right now and like, yeah, the, these guys are pretty much, you know, the, these guys are a very hot contender for the uh, for the RLCS, uh, you know, for, for, for sorry, RLCS, sorry, RLRS, mm. I should say. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm expecting to see a lot of good, uh, a lot of good shit from them. I'm expecting to see a lot of good shit from a lot of different teams. They are going under the name Scooby Snacks. Uh, Which I know, love uh, so much. <laughs> that is such a good song. Have you ever heard Scooby Snacks? You must have. I'll get up for um, you. I mean, I know the reference to the Scooby Doo shit, but I don't know. I don't know about the, uh, the about the song itself. So uh, you know, I can couldn't tell you for that one. Fun loving criminals, Scooby Snacks. Look it up after the stream. Trust me. Fun loving criminals. I'm gonna quickly write that down to make sure that yeah. I. Uh, like I have proper that, uh, '90s vibes there, dude. Fun loving criminals. I said the waterfall result as well. Shit. All right, I'll have to make sure I watch that after the show, because we are coming closely to the end of it for now. Though um, I do want to say, do we again? We kind of mentioned the idea that this might be, a, that, you know, the dream hack result might be in a flash in the pan for a Zeno Moon, but very clearly it's not. Nope. And um, obviously we expect them to make RLRS next se the, 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 this season. But what do we think about them going forward after the fact? That that's a hazy one because we know what the level is like. Already in RLCS, then you've got Methan and Secret, or sorry, X Secret, now um, whatever is their name, or Melon Squad, whatever they're feeling like, because it's the same guys, well, you know, Volus. Are, 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 are they going to be part of Veloce still? Because that's another thing as well. No, it's like, what the fuck's going on? With? They're not, so it was just for the that one lap event. Yeah. For fuck's sake. <laughs> I mean, they could get picked up again. Who knows? But for this period, they're not. Uh, maybe that's just because they don't have a locked-in squad. Um, because with this rival one, they played with Calix instead of Niels. Because they're trying out for that third man, which I completely respect them for. You know, they've got that third role, which they can just keep cycling players through, trying it out. They didn't play as well at Dreamhack as they are probably expecting. They thought they'd make it into day two. So, like... They might have some problems with Niels there, and Calix is a fantastic player as it already is. So let them just test out, and I'm sure they're going to be one of these teams which, I mean, if they don't have a team by the time the Elite Series comes around, you know, an org by Elite Series, the Elite Series guys will be looking to pick them up because it is always the case, you know? Yeah, you know, I and I'm, I'm I want to see some, uh, you know, I, I want to see some good shit out of those guys, and especially from Zeno Moon as well. I want to see some good shit out of those guys, mm -hmm. uh, because right now it's it's really good to see some relatively old boys, some relatively old names come up and do some really good shit in Rocket League again. Uh, the you return know, so... of Zenzus is beautiful. Exactly, the return of Zenzus, like fuck yes. So yeah, well played from Zeno Moon to take this victory. Good luck in the RLRS. You have a really good chance of making a run, and again, I'm really excited to see where it goes from there. But we'll have to talk about all that in more detail next time because that is the end of this week's episode of RL Aftershock. A bit of a beefy one, so I hope you've enjoyed the slightly longer episode with a little bit of drama, a little bit of ranting, uh, but a lot of great action from the Rocket League EU scene. I don't know what's coming up next week, Bacon, other than the trials, which uh, might cover in massive bulk, I think. Yeah, we've got trials on Tuesday, which would be like the last chance for the bubble tomorrow, teams the to, <laughs> yeah, so tomorrow, uh, to try out their squads and make sure they've got the right decision before they're having to close roster lock uh, before the uh, qualifiers for RLRS. But otherwise, it's, next week is probably going to be a dead one because I say a dead one, but this weekend coming, so this Sunday, the 3rd of March is the first qualifier for RLRS. That's why everything now is just going to be quiet because RLRS qualifies.
Yeah, and I'm not sure how many shows we'll do in that sort of particular period of time. We might take a couple of weeks off because, like, we'll be really pressed for content at that point. Obviously, none of the, none of the open qualifiers get streamed. Um, so, you know, we, we don't have a whole lot of no, information to pull I, from. It's, it's a weird one because I could have a word with Shice and try and get anything, but it's hard to I mean, if you can, we, we'll fucking do it on Aftershock. I'll fucking, you know, I'll commission some last second graphics from Andy and we can, you know, we can just go ham. So, mm. you know, like, if you, if, you, if you can get it done, I'm down. So... <laughs> Or if you want to do it for Rewind, that's also fine as well. I mean, I was thinking know. Rewind and Rival, I'm not going to lie. Uh, um, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'll be casting it anyway, so who cares? But it's just basically... Yeah, most likely. It could be done a bit like... With, there's probably going to be a thing about RL or RS coming up this season. You know, the games they don't stream. Uh, the, the talks have to start soon with trying to get all of that actually cleared up because they don't like doing it. Like they, they, they don't come to us about it, so we'll have to go to them. Ah, uh, then. Well, again, I'm hoping to see a little bit of good action. Again, I'm not sure how many shows there will be, so be ready for there not to be a podcast next week. And boom, I mean, at, <laughs> uh, the original plan, right, for this podcast was to do one every week during the season, and during the off season, we'll do one every other week, so that way we're not, you know, we're not hampering the content because there's so much shit to talk about in Rocket League these days that obviously that's gone right out the window. So maybe we might go for a, 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 a break next week. But again, mm. keep your eyes locked to all the twitters and all the social medias to find out exactly where whether or not that ended up being the case. Again, Twitter at rl. After shocking, case you're not aware, and the Twitch channel where we stream usually every Monday from five o'clock. Again, this week not quite the case at twitchtv aftershock You can go ahead and try. Uh, uh, you can go ahead and sign up or subscribe to the audio podcast via anchorfm aftershock where you can find the listings on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, and seven other great podcast platforms. Go to your favorite place or request your favorite place to listen at anchorfm aftershock Make sure you join the Discord. Make sure you follow the Twitter. Keep your eye out. For for our special secret project, which I've been teasing for too fucking long. It's been so low, slow <laughs> progress. Um, Can we but just tre- say what it is already, please? No, because I want, my announcement is fucking... Is, I've got my social media strategy. And rest assured, there will be an announcement and we will do it live. We'll do it, have to do it live. I don't want to do it in the audio mm-hmm. version, okay? But you can rest assured it's coming soon. But with that being said, any final thoughts from you without spoiling our special secret projects? No, I'm currently just watching this gif of a guy jumping off a roof into a table and it's fucking glorious. <laughs> what? I'll send you this gif, don't worry. Okay, you do that. Right, well, till then, uh, not, oh, not till then. I'm not going to go jump off a roof or anything like that. But till oh, next time, please? guys, till next week. So fuck you. Till next time, we're going to see you all on the next episode of The Aftershock.